Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the Demystifying Reincarnation series. <coughs> Suppose there is something which is the fundamental reality, which is the reality that enables us to experience all other reality. And suppose we have a tool for explaining reality, a very powerful tool for explaining reality, but this tool has no explanation for the reality that underlies all other reality. How would that situation be reconciled? The reality which underlies all other reality is our consciousness. It is because we are conscious that we are able to perceive things and understand whether they are real or unreal. And the most powerful tool we use for understanding reality today is, according to mainstream opinion, modern science. And modern science, despite its dazzling achievements, has very little understanding of consciousness. It is science, one of the greatest mysteries. So, in the Scientific American, December 1995 issue, David J. Chalmers, Chalmers writes in an essay, The Puzzle, Puzzle of Conscious Experience. Conscious experience is at once the most familiar thing in the world and the most mysterious. There is nothing we know about more directly than consciousness, but it is extraordinarily hard to reconcile it with everything else we know. So, now what exactly is consciousness? <coughs> Before we get into technicalities, Let's uh, look at it from an intuitive perspective. We all know that we are conscious, that's, that's our intuition. So an intuition also plays a vital role in science. This is acknowledged by an authority uh, as great as Albert Einstein. He states, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. This means that intuition is something which comes from above and rationality is something which we direct. So it's a sacred gift, it's something which intuition actually is what guides most scientific research and our rational mind is what any goes along, what we make it okay, think this way, go this way, we direct it. So now let's look at our intuition and let's apply it to the issue of consciousness. Now we'll consider five intuitive meditations to understand consciousness. At a very simple level, consciousness refers to our sense of self-awareness and world awareness. There is an I-ness. There is an I, there is a self who is aware of oneself and the things around oneself. So that is at a basic level consciousness. So now we could begin by asking who is it that perceives? Now, is it the eyes that perceive? Say I am looking at you. Is it the eyes that are perceiving? But the eyes are actually present even in the dead body. Is it the ear that is hearing? The air is also present in a dead body. And here the dead body can't see or hear. Then is it the brain? The brain that perceives? But later we will discuss whether the brain is the source of consciousness. What is the problem with such theories? But right now, you can again take the same logic that the brain also has is also present in a dead body. And yet it is not able to perceive. Now we may say that, 
oh but you know in the eyes in the brain there are chemicals and the chemicals have to be functioning in a particular way and when they are functioning in a perfect way well coordinated way then that is when we are able to see but that raises the question then is our sense of eyeness a product of certain chemicals the presence of certain chemicals or the or the presence of the combination of certain chemicals now we know that our body largely the the, the substance that is present most in the body is water now so much water throughout our life so much water comes into our body and so much water goes out of our body now do we feel watery do we feel that i am a watery person no we don't so if we were asked are we just a bag of chemicals our intuitive answer would be no yes chemicals may be there in the body you know most life is made of organic chemicals this carbon now do we feel ourselves as carbony as carbonaceous no we don't sulfur if we consider the chemicals that comprise the body the sulfur there's potassium there is uh, carbon dioxide there is oxygen there are various such substances that are there are they what we are are they the essential stuff of our identity are they the source of our emotions be they individually or combined no oh, these these are, these are just essential chemicals and not just the uh, we'll discuss about the consciousness further but those chemicals those elements have certain properties which we don't identify with ourselves and we have certain properties which we don't identify with those chemicals we have consciousness emotions which we don't identify with them they have wateriness or uh, or uh, car you could use the word carboniness carboniousness which uh, sulfurousness whatever it is we don't identify those with us so they are distinct categories and more importantly let's consider the idea of value that if we, if we analyze all the chemicals in the body and we took their quantity and we summed their value of each chemical in that quantity that would work out to be just a few hundred rupees or a few dozen dollars it's barely worth uh, a one day's earning of a average person so what what is going on over here the chemicals really don't much have much value but we have immense value so where is that sinus so coming from that question still remains and if you consider further uh, again going back to the chemicals point you know who is it that remains the same when the body keeps changing science has revealed to us that the body if we were just our chemicals if our sense of fineness if our consciousness were somehow a result of the chemical composition or the chemical coordination of the body then actually the body is is changing constantly in fact pim van lommel uh, in the book science of science, near experience explains that our cells may be seen as our body's physical building blocks yet every day some 50 billion cells in our body are broken down and regenerated this is equivalent of 500000 cells per second every two weeks all of the molecules and atoms in our body cells are replaced and yet we experience our body as a continuity how can we explain this experience of continuity of the ever changing body so the question that lomel raises is profound the body changes yet my sense of eyeness remains the same what is the locus of that eyeness which remains unchanging amidst the changing body could it be something beyond the body now let's consider con continuing this chemical analysis who is gone when a person dies we in our languages in all languages is passed away <clears throat> she's gone now who has passed away who has gone we normally identify a person with the body but the body remains the same and if we considered say <coughs> the body's chemical composition 
at if t is equal to t0 is the time when a person dies and if you consider the body body's composition at t0 minus delta t at a little a few moments before death and then t0 plus delta t a few moments after death we would not find any significant difference in the body's chemical composition it was not it is not that there is some special chemical that is present in the body and that pops out of the body <coughs> and the body dies at that time you know the the image just, just before death and after that the chemical composition the mass the weight the, of the body they remain the same and yet there's something vital that has changed and again this is not just a matter of uh, language because we all feel that our loved one is no longer there although the body is there we feel that the loved one is not there so who or what is it that has gone and then let's consider a fifth meditation who is the owner of the body that means that right now when we look at our body if i look at my hand you now i say this is my this is my finger so if this is my finger who is the i who exerts owner's right over the finger now we may say is it is it the brain but we say my brain is it the heart but actually you know in certain cases in certain operations the doctors can take out the heart and they can show slightly they can take it out of the body the heart is here you know if my hand were cut off and my hand were held over here in front of me then if my palm say were cut off or one finger were cut off held in front of me it would be my finger so that my finger is no longer connected with me but my finger is there i am here so this exercise of dismemberment could be done with practically all parts of the body and still the i would remain and again this is important to know that this is not semantic quibble this is not semantics we are not just quibbling over words we all feel ourselves as distinct beings who are owners of the body so who is the i that is the owner of the body that is a question that intuitively makes us feel that there is something more to us than our body that we are more than our chemicals the unchanging i is different from the changing body now when a when we meet a relative after many months many years many years say and we may say if a small boy has grown hey you have grown up so much what do we mean you has remained the same but i have grown up something is changing but something is unchanging we include that so we understand that there is a unchanging locus to the changes that we see in people what is that unchanging locus now moving forwards this is after this intuitive analysis now let's go towards a little more scientific analysis Uh, this as the scientific opinion at least the mainstream scientific opinion today is materialistic that is matter is the source of consciousness and especially the matter in the brain is the source of consciousness so phys- physicist nick herbert in quantum reality in his book quantum reality beyond the new physics states that science's biggest mystery is the nature of consciousness It is not that we possess bad or imperfect theories of human awareness. We simply have no such theories at all. About all we know about consciousness is that it has something to do with the head rather than the foot. So, it is something to do with the head rather than the foot. Today, a science mainstream approach is materialism. That means the mainstream scientific community sees the whole of world the whole nature as an interaction of material objects say fundamental particles moving according to impersonal laws uh, that apply, that uh, they hold apply all over the universe and extending this paradigm to consciousness they feel consciousness can also be explained in terms of material laws applied to the uh, brain chemicals and yet there are many eminent scientists including nobel laureates who are questioning such materialistic explanation of consciousness among such scientists are the nobel laureate neuroscientists such as john eccles wilder penfield and charles 
Sherrington. They are urging a that they are saying that a complete explanation of consciousness requires that we be open for non-material explanations. And this was decades ago. This openness to non-material, the non-material, was exhibited by another Nobel laureate, Albert Zenz Georgi, who wrote in Biology Today. In my search for life, I ended up with atoms and electrons, which have no life at all. And somewhere along the line, life has run out through my fingers. So in my old age, I am re now retracing my, stay, my steps. So what are the problems with the materialistic theory of consciousness? When eminent scientists are, are seeking its reconsideration, what is it that is prompting its reconsideration? There are many things, but let's consider three of them. We'll discuss three questions. How can brain cells, which are themselves unconscious, produce consciousness? Second is how do our brain cell, how do our memories stay intact despite the constant regeneration of our brain cells? And how can consciousness change the structure of the brain as observed in neuroplasticity? So the first is the most fundamental. How can unconscious brain cells produce consciousness? Now this problem has plagued modern science ever since its dawn, ever since science started attempting to explain all of reality, and that consciousness remained a mystery. And this is acknowledged by English biologist T. H. Huxley, who, despite being a very aggressive advocate of evolution, despite being a materialist, he acknowledged that consciousness was a big problem. He said, how is it that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. So he's basically saying this is mystical. If Allah then uh, rubs his lamp and a jinn appears, then there's actually there's no correlation between the two. Hey, this is done. This how is this happening? There's no scientific explanation for the uh, for that idea. That may seem as fantastic. It may seem fantastical, uh, mythological even. But here, what is happening? We are saying that when certain nervous tissues are stimulated, when uh, <coughs> certain signals pass into the brain, at that time you feel conscious. So how are they? How does that happen? He said that is no, <coughs> it's it's profoundly mysterious. This Huxley statement of the 19th century, and today we are in the 21st century, and even now this problem remains. In fact, in the in 2005, in 2005 Science Magazine uh, published a special 125th anniversary issue in which they listed 125 questions that science still has to answer. And this, this reputed publication of the American Advancement, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAS, it listed the second 125 questions. The second most important question, after the first question, after the, the first question was, what is the universe made of? Because there, there's the whole dark body, dark matter and dark energy. It's a whole different concept, but that is a big mystery. So the second question was, after what is the universe made of us, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And of course, many scientists have suggested that the question itself needs to be rephrased to, is there a biological basis to consciousness? But let's move forward, even with the question as it is. Why is it such a big problem for scientists to explain what is the biological basis of consciousness? So the science writer, Greg Miller framed the problem in this way. How can a particular pattern of photons hitting the retina produce the experience of seeing, say, a rose? So, photons enter into the eyes. They hit the eye, they go into the eye, they hit the retina. Now, after that, a certain signal is generated which are basically nerve stimulations, which pass through the optic nerve to the brain. 
to part of the optical area of the brain and then after that is profound mystery what happens oh first of all we could say there are how does the image of a rose emerge in our consciousness where it is the experience of seeing and feeling take place who is it that sees the rose and who is it that feels the unique emotions associated with it, such an experience so if you consider the brain as a black hole okay the photons go inside the eyes from there through the optic nerve some signals go to the brain but after that what happens after that okay we see a rose but is there a how does that image of a rose emerge in a brain emerge in a consciousness the brain is simply made up of uh, neurons there are there are brain cells there is axon there is dendrites there are, and there are connections synapses in the dendrites it's like a long <coughs> long thin cells with with uh, with wire like arcs going out and when they connect that synapses so now there is nothing like which can correlate with the ex with the image of a rose coming up and nothing that can correlate with who is going to see that image who is going to feel the emotions of seeing that image where does all this happen it's a profound mystery now of course many materialist scientists try to say that somehow this happens in the brain the sense of iness the experience the phenomena of consciousness all this happens in the brain through the interaction of neurochemicals chemicals in the brain but then there are other researchers who have pointed out that the activities of brain cells and our conscious experience of emotions are two very distinct things consider this the statement in the journal of consciousness studies by astrophysicist piet hat and philosophy professor bas van frassen both from princeton university if i have ever seen an incompatible pair of concepts it's a configuration of molecules and a conscious experience life emerging out of lots of molecules consciousness emerging out of lots of nerve cells well why not consider time as emerging out of clocks without clocks no accurate time measurement and without a good clock and a good clock pro provides excellent correlations with the flow of time but time surely does not emerge out of a clock as this time and clock example is striking because we we will will we know well what the time is by the way the clock hands move so there is definitely a correlation but time is not emerging from the clock time exists independently and we come to know of time through the motions on the clock but time itself if somebody try to reduce time to the hands of a clock and to the motions of the hands of a clock the person would be simplistic it would be reductionism to, to the level of absurdity time is distinct similarly consciousness itself is distinct from the body from the brain colin mcgin a philosophy professor from the university of miami again states the problem the brain processes held to constitute conscious experience consist of physical events that can exist in the absence of consciousness electricity in the brain correlates with mental activity but electricity in your tv presumably does not so how can electrical power be the essence of conscious experience how can electrical processes be the essence of conscious experience what is he saying over here what is colin uh, saying over here and the important thing is that okay essentially what is happening in the brain is the flow of electrical signals and the electrical signals signals in a tv set they are also going over there they are uh, there is neural there is digital circuitry over there there is electro electronic circuitry over there and here there is neural circuitry but the flow essentially is of the same electrical energy so if it doesn't produce consciousness here why should it produce consciousness here there is no reason for it to produce another researcher neuroscientist steven harnard in the journal of consciousness studies in volume 4 number 4 april uh, 1 2000 he states that the problem is clear hard and staring us informally in the face i have feelings i have feelings so what does this mean 
that actually sometimes we have computers or calculators or other devices which can do the same things which many of the things which we can do so for example we will discuss this more later but suffice it to say that we are trying to do a complex calculation and we do it and a computer or a calculator does a complex calculation now associated with the activity of doing the calculation we experience joy yeah i got the answer right and the computer does the same thing the digital device is the same thing but it does not experience any emotions so why do we have feelings as far as the concept of how the digital circuitry works in a machine and how the neural circuitry works in the brain there are remarkable conceptual similarities so in a sense if the computer can calculate it without any feelings our brain could also process without any feelings uh, but we have feelings so just as feelings are not associated with digital circuitry they are not associated with the neural circuitry and that means that the feelings come from somewhere else they come from a non material source what is that non material source that question is what is causing many researchers to open their minds to a non materialist paradigm in our next session we'll discuss further problems with the non material with the materialist par explanation of consciousness that is how do our memories stay intact in spite of the constant regeneration of the brain, brain cells and also how can people uh, who have no brains still have consciousness how can the brain change and still how can the consciousness change the brain cells as happens in neuroplasticity so to, uh, to summarize in this session we discussed how the, we discussed the mystery of consciousness intuitively we saw that reducing ourselves to our material bodies it runs counter intuitive to our sense of consciousness who is it that perceives are we just chemicals the chemical the cells in the body the chemicals comprise cells in the body cells keep changing still we are still we remain the same nothing changes chemically immediately before death and immediately after that yet something substantial changes so who is it that is gone and when when we are living who is it that is the owner of the body these intuitive intuitions point us towards our core which seems to be something beyond the body and then we discussed getting into more scientific technicality about what are the problems with materialist theory of conscious theories of consciousness so first problem is which we discuss how can unconscious brain cells produce consciousness that is a problem which was there from the time of huxley even now it is listed as the second among the 125 prob questions that science is yet to answer and it states that actually uh, the when photons hit our eyes at that time you know, where does the image of a rose come up how does it come up who is it that sees and who is it that experiences emotions based on seeing and saying that this happens by brain cell somehow by the pro chemical processing of the brain cells is like saying that the movement of the hands of a clock produces time they are two just categorically different concepts this is the machine the problem is that the same set of phenomena electrical signals going through a tv don't produce consciousness why should electrical signals going through a brain produce consciousness that a calculator can do the same things which we humans can do calculator does not have feelings we have feelings the hard problem of consciousness as it is called is extremely hard and that is making people look towards making even top researchers look towards non materialist explanations for consciousness we'll discuss this more in our next session thank you hare krishna